Agenda item three is an evidence session as part of our Article 50 inquiry on the withdrawal agreement and negotiation of the future relationship between the UK and the European Union. We're delighted today to be joined by the Secretary of State for Scotland, Alistair Jack, MP, uh, in what I believe is your first appearance before a Scottish Parliamentary Committee, Mr Jack, so welcome. And uh, the Secretary of State is joined by his officials, Gillian McGregor, CBE Director, and Nick Leake, Deputy Director of Policy, uh, in the Office of the Secretary of State for Scotland. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the meeting and to the committee today. And I'd like to invite the Secretary of State to make an opening statement of, I believe it's three or four minutes, Secretary of State. Yes. Yeah. And as you've covered the, the first two or three paragraphs... Yeah. <laughs> that should speed things up. So I, I, obviously I welcome the opportunity to appear in front of this committee and thank you for the introductory remarks, convener. As you correctly point out, I have Gillian McGregor with me on my right and on my left, uh, Nick Leake from the Scotland office. And as you also point out, this is my, not only my first um, uh, visit to the, it's not only my first visit to the Scottish Parliament committee, it's my first visit to the Scottish Parliament for any engagement, official engagement. So thank you for that. And I'm sorry that the last meeting was uh, postponed due to an unexpected cabinet meeting, but obviously I'm very pleased uh, to, that I was able to get here uh, in such quick notice. Uh, turning to the remarks, the, the opening remarks, on the 31st of January, we delivered on the promise made to the British people nearly four years ago, and we finally uh, left the European Union. And we left the European Union as one United Kingdom, and we're now free to determine our own future and form relationships with old allies and new friends around the world. The UK government will negotiate these relationships on behalf of the United Kingdom. But we are clear that the devolved administrations should be closely involved in the process, both at ministerial level, for example, via the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations, but also via ongoing and constructive engagement between officials. Turning to today's session, understandably, you'll be interested in both the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol in Scotland and the building of a future relationship with the EU. But first, let me emphasize that Northern Ireland will remain part of the UK Customs Territory. Tariffs are not payable for movements of goods within the UK, and this will allow Northern Ireland to benefit from the trade deals that we intend to strike around the world. Furthermore, the Prime Minister has been very clear that beyond the limited changes introduced by the protocol, there will be no change to GB Northern Ireland trade. Second, there is no need for a free trade agreement with the EU to involve accepting EU rules. And I think that's a very important point because no other com comparable FTA involves acceptance by one party of the rules of the other. The UK will maintain the highest standards, better in many respects to those of the EU, but without the compulsion of a treaty to do so. As the government has been clear, we want a relationship with the EU which is based on friendly cooperation between sovereign equals and centred on free trade. We are not asking for a special, bespoke or unique deal. We want a comprehensive free trade agreement similar to Canada's, and in the very unlikely event that we do not succeed, our trade will be based on our existing withdrawal agreement deal with the EU. The choice is therefore not deal or no deal in that regard. Throughout the transition period and beyond, my priorities are clear. They are to negotiate the best possible future relationship with the EU, as well as other partners around the globe, for Scotland and the rest of the UK, and to uphold the Union and to help grow Scotland's economy. Now we've left the EU, our fishermen and coastal communities will be free of the common fisheries policy and our world-class exporters will benefit from new, trades or new trade around the globe. <clears throat> our points-based immigration system will ensure that the Scot Scottish economy continues to gain access to the labour it requires and will not and we will treat everybody based on their skills and, and, and their contribution, not on where they came from. This will mean it will get a lot easier for Scottish companies to recruit the labour they need from outside the EU, EEA countries, but it will be harder to recruit from within the EU, EEA countries. <clears throat> the Under Secretary of State and I have been very uh, keen to meet with Scottish stakeholders over the last week, and we've done so to discuss the genuine difficulties that we acknowledge arise from some of the points-based system, and we may, I don't know, we may come on to talk about that later. However, I'm very clear that the salary thresholds that we have in place are now reasonable. The threshold for a job in the shortage occupation list is below the Scottish living wage, and we will not lower this further. 
The new system provides an opportunity for employers in Scotland to make the case for the inclusion of a range of roles, which up to now have been out of scope of the visa regime. And we believe that companies should tra treat employees fairly. And that's, the Scottish TUC made that point very clear to me last week and, and told me quite clearly they were pleased with that in that regard. A period of adjustment will inevitably be required, but the government will continue to support businesses through these changes as we develop the new system. And looking ahead, I'm confident that 2020 will be a year of optimism and opportunity as we begin to unleash our potential. And my ministerial team and I and the office will continue to work tirelessly to represent Scotland's interests and make sure we secure the best possible relationship with the EU and other countries around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jack. Um, can, can I start by asking if you could perhaps set out for us what the UK government's current estimate is of the economic impact of leaving the EU for the UK and for Scotland uh, on either a Canada-style deal or a no-deal scenario? We, we believe that the best, you know, we, we have to follow through on the uh, respecting the referendum of 2016. And we believe the best outcome is a Canada-style agreement, and we believe that that will give Scotland uh, a lot of opportunity. As the uh, Minister for the Department of International Trade said only uh, on Monday, I think, this week, Scottish businesses, whether it's whisky or, or um, textiles, and obviously that we have the agri-food agri businesses, they will benefit from these free, free trade deals, but also of huge benefit is being outside the common fisheries policy. And we see that ability to, um, over time, increase the harvest we take from our marine resources, better manage our marine resources. We see the opportunity to rebuild our coastal communities and uh, in increase employment and prosperity. So we think that a Canada-style trade agreement brings many benefits. There's always um, a bit of yin and yang in any, in any change, but we, the change is, we believe that with the change that has come, Canada is the best way forward. Okay. And what, what is the cost of that? What estimate have you done of the cost of that economically? Well, the, 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 it's about being positive about what the opportunities are in front of us. We, we, the situation we find ourselves in is that we are delivering on the referendum, we're leaving the EU, and therefore the, we, we have assessed that the best way forward is to go for a trade deal based on precedent. And the pre precedent that we like is Canada. It's the one that Michelle Barney offered to Mrs May not so very long ago. And it, we, we, we have a time frame that's very tight to do this, so we have to acknowledge that, that what's in front of us is important is the time frame to get a trade deal. And to get a trade deal in that time frame, we believe going on precedent, so for trade, think Canada, for uh, fisheries, think Norway, we want, to, we want to be negotiating as an independent coastal state. So we're only asking for precedent on existing deals that other nations have with the EU. Right, that, that, that's, that's understood. I get what I'm, I'm getting at is the actual cost of it, the economic cost of it. What analysis have you done of the cost of it? Well, the this has been debated much in the, in the, in the British Parliament, and the Treasury um, have, have many assessments on the cost, but the, 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 the reality is that they take, they, the, we, have, we as a government, as a new government, have taken the view that we're going to be optimistic those, those, uh, some of the analysis were published before, that nothing has changed, and on, but we, on the back of that, we believe that the best way forward is to go with a free trade agreement, be optimistic about the future, and the best free, free trade agreement that's, that, that is there, if you like, on the shelf, not, not ask, we're not asking for anything to be written that's bespoke. The best free trade agreement for us is, is a Canada one, the CETA. Thank you. Well, you, you did mention analysis that had been published before. I take it you're referring to the, the Treasury's analysis in April uh, 2016 and its analysis of the impact of a Canada-style deal, which you mentioned, would be a reduction in UK GDP of 6.2% after 15 years as compared uh, to remaining a member of the EU. So given that that's the, the deal that you're pursuing, do you think that's an acceptable price to pay, a reduction of 6.2% in GDP? Well, I don't, I don't accept that because the, um, 
the situation, when I was on the Treasury Select Committee, we looked at a lot of the analysis, and we looked at a lot of the analysis that happened prior to the 2016 referendum, and the one conclusion we drew that every single one running into 2016 and what would happen immediately after a vote to leave the EU, every single prediction and analysis including by the Bank of England, was completely wrong. So I think what we have to do is recognise that we're a strong, outward-looking nation, we are very good at trade, we always have been, and, it, and that we need to focus on doing a free trade agreement, uh, no, no tariffs, no quotas, and then with the EU, and then get on doing trade agreements with the rest of the world that enable us to build and strengthen our economy. Yeah, I'm, I'm just struggling to, find, to understand why you think all the predictions are wrong. I mean, the Scottish Government did its own modelling for the impact on Scotland and it, uh, it came to a very similar conclusion to the UK Treasury, which you know, isn't always the case that the UK Treasury and the Scottish Government agree with one another. When and they also said that there would be a 6.1% reduction and that would cost every person in Scotland £1,600. We, when we analysed it, we had Oxbridge professors come who, who said that the, the, the Treasury forecasts they felt were wrong. I mean, you can go back and look at the papers from, the, from the, tr the Treasury Committee. We had people on both sides of the argument. I still maintain that we are in, it, it's, there's no point looking backwards. We are in a position now where we have left the EU. We've delivered and respected the democratic outcome of the referendum. And that we, the, the focus now is on taking the opportunities, and there are many in front of us, and using them to best advantage to build the Scottish and UK economy so that all our people prosper. And, you know, we want to level up, as you know. We want to create uh, higher wages for people, uh, and we want to create more prosperity. And there's no point looking back to what predictions were. The reality is it has happened. We have, we have left. There, there's hindsight... It is is 2020 vision, but and and we can we, we all we can tell you is that in hindsight, all the things that were predicted to happen in 2016, if we voted to leave, didn't happen. As regards to what comes next, well, of course, but we haven't actually, you know, we're still in the the as you call it, the implementation period. We haven't actually left yet. We we, we have left, but we haven't, you know, we're still in this. That is correct. And we're now period. scoping the trade deals, and we're now scoping, but but. but we, and we will leave and we will, you, we, as, as the fifth strongest economy in the world, I'm absolutely confident we will prosper. Yeah. And, we must, say, and we must look at it with optimism. Are you the UK Treasury was wrong in, in its predictions? Well, the UK Treasury forecasts, I mean, when I sat at the Treasury Select Committee, the, 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 the Treasury forecasts for growth or for many other things were often wrong. I mean, that's acknowledged. The one thing that uh, forecasters seem to be quite consistent at is getting things wrong. And we looked at that and uh, that analysis has been the case for many things, not just this. But I think we will grow. I think you will see us grow our economy. I stand by this, that we will grow our economy very successfully outside the EU. And I think we will do very good trade deals around the world. Mm -hmm. now you have actually, the UK government has actually done modelling on one trade deal, which mm -hmm. is a, a proposed uh, tra the trade deal with uh, the United States. Um, and the UK Government Department for International Trade has predicted that such a deal uh, could increase UK GDP by between 0.07% and 0.16% in the long run. So you have done uh, modelling now. Um, so you, you have more confidence in that modelling? I, modelling is, modelling is something, as, you know, I, I, 25 years in business before I came into politics two and a half years ago, and I looked at many business plans and many forecasts, many models produced by banks, business advisors, accountants. None of them turned out to be the outcome. The outcome is what you make of it. The outcome is the gumption and the commitment you, pr you, you put to what's in front of you and making the best of it. That's how, that's how life works. I'm not hanging on a treasure, just because they give us a model that says there's going to be an uplift in, in GDP from an American trade deal. The American trade deal, will, the uplift will be based on the, on the quality of that trade deal, but the standards we set. that's your government saying that. I, as I say, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not standing by, uh, uh, forecast, I'm standing by as a practical person with a practical business life behind me. Some, that you get on, you look at the problems in front of you, you come up with solutions, and you work hard to get the best outcomes.
Right. So notwithstanding that you don't really put a great deal of store between your, your own government's modelling uh, in this... ...store in forecasting. I put a great yeah, deal okay. of store in planning and... Okay. and making a right. success of things through hard work. Right. So al although you, you don't put a great deal of store between you, uh, on UK government's uh, <coughs> modelling, we do have modelling on a future trade agreement with the US, but we don't have any modelling that's been done now on the preferred Canada-style deal that you favour. Will we get that modelling soon? Will we get economic analysis soon of that? The, the, Nick, yes, you want yeah, to? Yeah, sure. So um, the, because the economic impacts of trade deal with the EU has been subject of, of considerable debate between various analysts. Um, um, and we've got such a variety of figures. I mean, I've, I've done forecasting in the Treasury as well. And to be fair, you make the best guess. And of course, that it, you're going to fight it out when you leave then. <laughs> it's all other things. It's all uh, all other things being equal. This will happen. All other things are never equal. So you're making the you're making the best estimate that you can. That's why all forecasts are wrong. Um, but it's impossible to have a single model uh, number or scenario that captures all the complexity that's involved in the various impacts of, of, of the various changes that will be felt in different So parts are you of the saying economy. your colleagues, so you say you do economic forecasting yourself, are you, uh, Mr. Leake, are, are you saying your colleagues were wrong in 2016 when they said that there'd be a 6.2% fall in GDP with a Canada style deal? Well, no forecast that I've ever been involved in has proved to be 100% accurate. It okay. can't possibly be. Um, okay. Because you're 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 not modelling the same thing. What was being modelled in 2016 is not what is not what's being done now. But um, the government is going to and has announced that we're going to invite contributions on the economic implications of the future relationship from a wide variety of stakeholders via a public consultation, which will happen later in the spring. So there will be that work, and, and it won't just be done internal, internally within government. Mm. It's going to be a public that, consultation. That, that's interesting. It. Why are you consulting people after you've published a negotiating mandate? Um, well, you've already decided that you, you know, you've got, you're, you're planning to pursue a kind of style deal, but you're now consulting people after you have decided on your, your mandate as opposed to before, to help you shape your approach? Well, the consultation will, will look at the economic implications and it will allow um, government to decide which tools it, will, it would like to take to maximise the, the, the beneficial implications that result from those changes and to mitigate any negative implication. That's standard practice. That's what, mm. that's what well, governments do. Of course, do. That's, not, that's not the same as, uh, as modelling the economic impact. So are we going to get a modelling of the economic impact of a Canada-style deal to see if it is still a 6.2% fall in GDP? There's going to be... Uh, we're going to invite contributions on the economic implications of the future relationship from a variety of stakeholders via a public consultation. So, so you're going to get other people to do the forecasting? No, no, this is not... The, the forecasting... Um, <clears throat> for, there are many forecasts. You've chosen one. Um, Which is yours. It, but it, but it's, it, it was... You've chosen one that was based on, on 2016 when we didn't know the outcome. Now, here we are in 2020. We do know the outcome. The outcome is a Canada-style trade agreement. And as I said earlier, What's important now is we, we focus our energies on securing that deal, no, trade, no, no tariffs, no quotas, and we then... Ca so our trade with the EU in that circumstance should carry on as normal. We should, then, we should then be looking to do more trade around the world and then strengthen our economy. That's my argument. As a, as a simple businessman looking at the situation in front of me, if the Canada-style trade agreement puts us broadly in the same position with the EU as we are at the moment, and I would argue that that is to their advantage because we have a hundred, almost 100 billion euro, it varies depending on the exchange rate, but almost 100 billion euro trade deficit with the EU. We take more German cars, more German white goods than any other country in the world other than China. It has to be in the EU's interest to have a free trade agreement with us. So, that, so in that situation, what we have at the moment will carry on as normal. And I don't see there being an impact, any difference to, to what, would, what would have happened anyway. Now, the, the, the EU zone may go into recession. I think that's entirely possible that that will happen. But that would have happened anyway, if that makes sense. Modelling is just modelling. It doesn't account for recessions. It doesn't account for a fall in GDP this year, world GDP on the back of coronavirus in the way it didn't account for a world GDP 
fall on the back of SARS. I, you I, just I deal with, yeah. you, in practical business terms, you deal with what's in front of you and you make the very best of it. Okay. I take it from what you're saying that there isn't, if just, just yes or no, there isn't going to be any new modelling on a Canada-style deal. We're not going to get any... Well, the Treasury may choose, that's a matter for the Chancellor, the Treasury may well choose to model when we see the outcome of the negotiations. But if, if the outcome of the negotiations is, is, is the CETA agreement, then the situation will be that broadly where we are, that their forecasts at the moment, they will carry on forecasting. But the forecasts are forecasts, they're not outcomes. Okay. I think I would just add to that, that, that um, you, know, clear, you know, in defence of my Treasury colleagues, um, the... Um, they would be doing this sort of modelling all the time, and the, the modelling that you you refer to um, was was done back in 2016. There will be constant modelling going on. These negotiations are in early stage. Things are changing, as the Secretary of State has pointed out. There are other external factors. Yeah. So, I mean, I would expect my Treasury colleagues to be continuing to model all the possible outcomes. Yeah. Could I be so bold as to ask that when you get that modelling, that you share it with the committee? Well, if the Treasury share the modelling, it, we, we, if they share it, then we'll be very happy to share it, but it's entirely a matter for the Treasury, that. So it might be modelling, but we'll never actually see the impact? Uh, well, it might be, but I, as I say, it's a matter for the Treasury, not for us. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm keen to bring in other members. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'm interested in the statement that under a FTA agreement, things would carry on as normal. The evidence the committee have taken from academics, from stakeholders, from economists um, doesn't support that position. And for the for to have a kind of trade relationship with the EU, there's an expectation of alignment and regulations. And the UK government have said they don't intend to align on trading issues with the EU. So I struggle to see how we can trade the same as we are at the moment if we're not prepared to work on a level playing field and have the alignment with EU? Okay, um, the point you raise is a very, very important one. And it's absolutely the case that we are not uh, signing up to a level playing field. Um, the, the principles uh, that we have laid out for this negotiation, it basically our objectives are, and we, we this, I learnt these at the, exactly the same time as Cabinet Secretary Mike Russell learnt them. So we, we met in Cardiff. The deputy uh, leader of the negotiating team, the deputy to uh, David Frost, came and presented to the devolved administrations. And the, 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 it was very simple. We would not trade off uh, a fishing agreement. Again, I'm going to give you the principles and you can just pick up in the hole, but it shows why it all knits together. We would not trade off a fishing, fisheries agreement against other, any other priority. That's one of our principles. The next one is we will not align or, or have a, 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 if you like, to accept level playing field, field terms. And the third one, which is linked into that, is we will not be ruled by the European Court of Justice on anything. You know, we are leaving the club and we have to leave the club in a, in, in a way that the, 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 the committee of the club aren't telling us what we can and can't do and setting the rules for us. Um, so that, that's, that, was our, that was laid out. I think that was also laid out in Parliament last week. And it, it, you can still go on and trade very successfully into countries with, without level playing field arrangements without aligning. You can, you can, on something set for equivalence, which is you have the same standards or higher, but not lower, or you can, you, but, but again, you're not ruled on that because equivalence gives you, gives you freedom of, of uh, flexibility on it. But, it's, but it, I, think, I think the important point is that if, if we were ruled by the ECJ, that would make life very difficult for, for, for the UK, and it would be, uh, we wouldn't be truly outside and properly outside the EU. So for that reason, we haven't set it. And there is no precedent, unless you can tell me otherwise, but I'm led to believe anywhere in the world where a free, a, in a free trade agreement, one country in that free trade agreement is subjected to the rules of another country. One sovereign entity is subjected to the rules of another sovereign entity. That doesn't exist in any free trade agreement in the world, and it won't exist in ours. Those changed circumstances wouldn't mean that we would carry on as normal. There will be well, significant we carry on changes trading as to normal. our trading if we're in that type of relationship. Why can't we and carry on trading as normal? The EU have also said, because the UK government are attached to the idea of a Canadian-style deal, that they 
they're not willing to entertain that because of our proximity to the European mainland. They don't see it's compatible um, that we could have the same deal as similar to, we'd have someone that's similar to Canada's. So why did Michel Barnier offer it to Mrs May? That was three years before. We're now in the current set of circumstances. You have argued the same when it comes to the convener's points about trade. You've okay. said that that's a previous situation. We're now in a new landscape. And in that landscape, you're arguing that the effect, the negative economic effect, won't be as significant as what was judged four years yes, ago. Yes, because I believe... So we're now in the uh, new landscape where the EU have said that we won't have the same deal as Canada. They will not entertain well, that. Well, that we have a, we, we, at the moment, we have a withdrawal agreement deal with them. We're asking to set up a free trade agreement deal. And I'm, I, proximity, I don't think, is any, uh, has anything to do with it. I've heard them make that remark, but that's just a negotiating position. You know, we're, we're, in the, we're ending the first week today of the, of the negotiations, and they've set out their positions. If, if they completely agreed with our position last week, we wouldn't be having a negotiation. But they don't, so we have to have a negotiation. And our position is that we don't want anything from them that is bespoke or special or different to what they do with other countries. We just want uh, something that's off the shelf, an agreement they already have. And for that but, reason... Sorry to interrupt, but it can't be off the shelf because even if it's the same as Canada's, there's a number of areas that's not involved in the Canadian deal. Security and defence, fisheries, data protection, science and research... Well, data protection, so would be looking all, for, more for all of those... Deal than what Canada has. You're absolutely right, Surely. you're absolutely right about that. And for all of those, there are other precedent deals with other countries. So data protection, the, the data agreements, and that's, that's just, we would, again, we would replicate the arrangement they have with Norway. So the, you can look and see, for, for, for fisheries, we would replicate the arrangements they have with Norway or Iceland. We're gonna be a sovereign nation. You know, we're leaving home, we're taking, we're not asking to have a, a key to the door, we're not asking to keep a bedroom in the house, we're not asking to be uh, paid out by the bank of mummy and daddy anymore. We're leaving home, we're going to be on our own, and we're going to look outwards to the world and do, and, and do the deals we have to do. But with our, with our closest partners, we would like to have a close trading relationship, and that's what a free trade agreement gives us. Now, I know other members are keen to come in, so can I just finish with the timescales? So we're also at a situation where negotiations are starting. The UK and the EU position look quite far apart at the moment. The timescale that has been set is really a false deadline that's been set by the UK government to conclude negotiations by December, and with this threat of walking out if we can't get progress by June, um, do you accept these timescales are extremely challenging and present problems for achieving a good, secure, long-term deal with the EU? So I accept, I don't accept that they present problems. I accept that they uh, are, are challenging. We've always accepted they're challenging. We're not, uh, the, 30, the 30th of June is, a take, is to take stock. That was made clear in, at the dispatch box last week by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. And we will take stock on where we are on the 30th of June. The 31st of December is the deadline. As again, someone who comes from a business background, I understand, and actually I did deals in France, uh, as, as well as other countries around the world, you do have to have deadlines to get deals done. If you don't have a deadline, things don't happen, and, 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 and it stretches on and on. So the deadline is, we think, the right thing to do. We believe that the free trade agreement can be done in those times, and as regards um, cynicism, I would point back to the 80 days we had to reopen the negotiations last year when the Prime Minister was very successful in doing what everyone said was impossible, quote unquote, by the EU, impossible. This is, this is a lump of stone that can't be carved into anymore and all the other lines that we were given. Uh, the reality was he went and renegotiated a deal that was impossible to reopen, to remove something that was impossible to remove in the form of the backstop, and we did it within 80 days. You know, if there's a will on both, from both parties to get things done, then things will be done. And I make the point again that I made earlier. It, this is absolutely within the EU's interest. We, you know, we have a massive trade deficit with them. And they, this is a, the, the, the EU, fi, you know, financial zone uh, that is you know you look at the levels of debts in, in the nations there that it, it is fragile you know Italy's debt is 2.7 trillion and rising and on it goes they need to carry on free, free trade with us it's absolutely imperative and Germany who are, who are our biggest trading partner it's imperative that that we don't stop free trade with Germany because Germany, it's in Germany's interest and they're, they're after all the country financing the EU Going back to the Secretary of State's previous comment about the fact that 
what we're looking for here, what the government are looking for, is an agreement um, uh, like that that the, the EU has agreed with others. So there, there are plenty of precedents and texts around. And I think the other um, advantage that both sets of negotiators will have is that we're very familiar with each other's systems. So I think in that sense, there's there's um, there's a feeling that that with the with the, the right energy and the will that, that there's plenty time to do it. But Ben, as I said earlier, the negotiations are in the very early stages. So um, it's to be expected that you would want to set deadlines to, to check your progress as you go along. Thank you. It's a supplementary from Kenneth Gibson. It is just a supplementary, though. Okay, yes, yeah. A supplementary. It's just about this candidate. I mean, this morning, uh, I wasn't actually intended to go down this road at all, but uh, uh, Secretary of State, welcome to the committee. But it's just that he seemed to have put an awful lot of eggs into this Canada basket. But last week's Economist says, and I, I, and I quote, that the Commissioner talks that Boris Johnson accepted robust commitments to ensure a level playing field in the political declaration attached to the Brexit withdrawal agreement. And as, as Claire Baker said, Britain is not like Canada. The bigger the trade flows and the shorter the distance, the more substantial the risk of being undercut by looser rules. So it looks almost like a fingers crossed kind of approach rather than an actual policy. Um, and if, if Canada is the model, then why is the, the, the UK government completely rejected without, I understand, even bothering to look at it, the Scottish government, government's representation on, for example, uh, migrant visas for uh, Scotland? I understand Jackson Carlaw has, uh, has disagreed with Priti Patel on this issue in discussions with the Prime Minister in the last 24 hours. So I'm just wondering why, why, why this obsession with, with, uh, with Canada when the EU is saying, I'm sorry, uh, that's not acceptable to the bloc? Because, I'll be, <coughs> going back to um, what um, Claire Baker said, it, it is, uh, uh, there's a time challenge here and therefore we're, we want to negotiate on the basis of precedent and the precedents that exist are clear with the deal, I mean there's, there are arrangements with other countries, Japan, Korea, but the Canada deal we believe is the one that fits best for our relationship with the EU and it, it, and it is an off the shelf, shelf uh, or as the Prime Minister might say, an oven ready agreement. So it, it makes sense for us to go with that one. Uh, we believe, and we believe it's good for our economy, but it's also very good for their economy, and that's something that's important to us. Um, I met with the Prime Minister yesterday with Jackson Carlaw, and we didn't... I was in the meeting, and I spoke uh, at some length following my stakeholder engagements in Scotland last week, with, with uh, in, in both in Stirling and in Glasgow, with a number of people. Um, I spoke about the challenges on migration to tourism, to hospitality, to, to seasonal agricultural workers, which I believe to be real and mm -hmm. require to be addressed. I have a, uh, two solutions that came out of my stakeholder engagements. Jackson mm -hmm. has, uh, and some of the MSPs have had other stakeholder engagements and they've come up with ideas. All I would say is that the solution that I uh, have in mind doesn't contradict uh, with the Home Secretary's position. It, uh, it, it is something that we can, that, that effectively we can build upon, if you like. I'm not going to go into the detail because it's still work in progress, but I'm absolutely sure that we will come up with a solution for those, uh, for those industries. We came up very early with the points-based system uh, as soon as we could after the 31st of January. So we wanted people to know very quickly what was in front of them. And I think the point-based system has many advantages. I put an article in the paper, the Glasgow Herald, about that last week, the Herald, as it's called now. And um, no one came out and contradicted because what I said in there was correct. You know, we, we are reducing, we're removing the cap for the number of migrants we can bring to the UK. We're reducing the thresholds. We, and there will be more people in the skills of tier two skills in the system. And there is also the shortage occupation list, I know. But in the, it, not even on the shortage occupation list, just in the tier two skills, there are, you know, filleting fish, working in abattoir, jobs in abattoirs, those sort of things. So, you know, they're all there on the, on the list. So we, now, it will, in, it will involve increasing wages, and I make no apology for that. But I, 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 I've been to see um, a, a fish processing plant in Iceland where the wages are substantially higher than they are here in the UK. It's doing a very similar job. And it is uh, it is competitive, you know. It's a it's a viable competitive business. So I, I make no apology for the fact that we think that if you stand in a cold factory filleting fish, you should be paid 
a number beginning with a two rather than a number beginning with a one. I, I think that's absolutely right. OK, but why is it given the, the direction of travel, which is welcome, uh, 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 um, certainly of late, then uh, did the UK government not look in detail at uh, the Scottish government's uh, proposals in terms of visa, which I, I, which I understand were dismissed out of hand, which is, I think, contemptuous of us, the, the Scottish government, this parliament, and indeed your own party members uh, within it. Um, you know, given your, your your obsession with all things Canadian, it appears at the moment. That's so, a, a rather strange anomaly. OK, so I, that's a fair, <laughs> again, that's a fair question. I, I, have, I did not... I, I know you're referring to the... the prompt re response from the Home Office, but I, the Scotland Office spent a lot of time looking at those proposals. We, we believe that the S code has weaknesses and some, uh, some uh, MSPs have confirmed that the, uh, you know, it's a, it would be a problem for the Home Office. So for instance, if you, the S code is where you live, and so if the S on the end of your tax code, when you lived in Gretna, you could still work in Carlisle or you could, et cetera, et cetera. So th there is a, there is a, a weakness in the, in the proposal in that regard. But I still maintain that the problems that exist for uh, seasonal agricultural workers um, going to Angus to pick soft fruit uh, are the same problems they have for uh, people picking apples in Somerset or many other examples I could bring up. And I think those problems that we have around tourism and hospitality are, are as extreme in Cornwall as they are in the northwest of Scotland, for instance. So we have to come up with a solution, and this has been my argument to the Prime Minister. We must, and he, and he agrees with me on this, we must come up with a solution that works for the whole of the UK. Uh, so it's based on the, not just the, the nation of Scotland, but also what may be the, the requirements in North Wales or what may be the requirements in Northern Ireland. We have to acknowledge that these problems are not just purely problems for Scottish businesses. They exist for other businesses in the UK, and the solution must be a UK-wide one. Okay, well, thank you, Philip. Members that want to Don't come in on migration, so yeah. I think you will be returning to this particular topic. Well, I'm but, sorry uh, if I went too far my answers. I <laughs> um, apologise for that. Uh, now going to go to Rachel Hamilton. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Secretary of State, the food and drinks industry want to keep tariffs, quotas, product checks and inspections um, to a minimum. First of all, how do you believe that the negotiations will achieve a good outcome for UK food producers and indeed seize new opportunities in export markets? And secondly... You mentioned the CETA agreement. CETA does protect geographical indica indications, um, but tariffs remain on poultry, eggs and meat. And I wondered how you felt the negotiations could accommodate both the rules of origin uh, in, in, in the same sense as the CETA agreement does, but also to protect the UK products and certain food products. Right. Nick's going to answer this question. I'll tell you what, you couldn't just lean into your microphone a bit because I've got terrible tinnitus sorry. at the moment and I, I couldn't hear half I'm of what sorry, you said. I'm sorry, Secretary of State. So, um, the, <laughs> but Nick will it's fine. Correct Did you. you hear the questions, Nick? Yeah, no, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Uh, am I, am I, do you actually hear me? Am I, yes, have I pressed I can. the button? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, on, on the, the, the detail of the CETA agreement, I mean, at the moment, we, we've used it today the term level, play, we've all used it, we've used the term level playing field to mean um, one country following the rules that are set by another country. But level playing field means different things in different contexts. And in the context of CETA, I've just pulled up on, on the iPad the European Commission's um, uh, document that talks about the benefits of CETA. And number two on that is, thanks to CETA, Canadian and EU businesses will now compete on a truly level playing field. That will create a host of new opportunities on the Canadian market for EU companies, especially smaller ones with up to 250 employees, which together account for 99% of all companies in Europe. In fact, with CETA, Canada has agreed to give EU companies better conditions for doing business than it gives to companies from other countries. So it's not that CETA doesn't contain any, any uh, provisions in those areas at, at all. It does, um, but it contains standard free trade agreement provisions and standard free trade agreement dispute resolution and standard free trade agreement um, uh, uh, processes if, if, if one country thinks that those are, that those are missed. You, you, you draw the very, very small, the, the example of the very, very small um, areas where CETA retains tariffs. I think CETA dis gets rid of 98.8% of tariffs Japan is 99.5 and South Korea is 99 point something else. Sorry, I'm, I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but it's, in, it's, it's between 99 and 100 in those cases. Um, 
at the moment, between the UK and the European Union, uh, there are zero tariffs, and therefore it isn't obvious to anybody in government why we should wish to impose any tariffs um, in, on any products. Um, again, that negotiations have just started, but actually nobody on the EU side is talking about any tariffs either. They always talk about zero tariffs, zero quota. And so as that is both sides' position, you can you can expect that that will be what we, are, what we are all trying to achieve in those negotiations. So it's not that suddenly we're going to impose a tariff on European eggs or that the EU is going to impose a tariff on our, our, our eggs. CETA is a nice shorthand because it's, it's um, one of the uh, most comprehensive um, trade agreements that the European Union has ever struck, along with Japan and South Korea. We think it's a modern trade agreement with modern dispute resolution and modern um, uh, regulation on things like level playing field. Um, but it doesn't mean that you have to cut and paste the tariffs on eggs from CETA. So CETA gets rid of almost all tariffs. Japan gets rid of almost all tariffs. South Korea gets rid of almost all tariffs. And nobody either in Brussels or London is talking really about wanting to impose any tariffs on trade between the UK and the EU. Finish. Okay. Um, Ross Greer. Thank you. Greer. Um, Secretary of State, the, the Prime Minister has insisted that there will be absolutely no checks either way between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but you've said there'll be checks at Larne and Belfast. Could you confirm who's correct? Um, well, we, bo we both are. We both are, and it's a very fair point you raise. Um, I didn't say Larne and Belfast, I said Larne, I think, probably, but I said on the Northern Ireland port. The Northern Ireland port. So there are currently, I know this as someone who um, brings dairy heifers in from Southern Ireland and who has exported beef in the past. Um, the, the situation is that on, uh, for animals and plants, you know, for, um, the, the fighters, sanitary and phytosanitary, but let's just say for animals and plants, and, and there are seeds and other bits and pieces come into it, but the, the situation is that there are checks uh, on those, uh, certain of those items. The animals are all checked through LAN, and that is not something that I envisage changing, and that was the point I was making. As regards uh, Northern Ireland GB trade, um, it says quite clearly in the protocol that there'll be unfettered access and that's what the Prime Minister is referring to. And I agree with him on that. But uh, th This confuses me because, I mean, you'll be aware of the, the leaked paper from the Treasury in November that said there will be substantial checks and said actually those checks would cost the, the equivalent to 30% tariffs on, on goods being purchased in Northern Ireland. But, I mean, HMRC told Arlene Foster, the Northern, Ar Northern Irish First Minister, that there'd be substantial checks. Steve Barclay, your colleague, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, has acknowledged uh, there'll be checks. I think he described them as minimal interventions. Every trade body, every business association, every elected representative in Northern Ireland has acknowledged that by the terms of this agreement, there will have to be checks because Northern Ireland to have to, to eliminate any chance of a land border, any kind of customs border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, there has to be some level of check between Northern Ireland and the UK because the UK is not going to be in the customs union. The, so you're referring to the, those administrative processes we believe will, can be done electronically and, uh, and so that's goods that are going from GB into Northern Ireland and, on, and, and passing on through the, the land border. They, they, they'll be, that will be an electronic. Michael Gove said but it would take up to five years for that smart border infrastructure to be in place, but the transition well, ends at the he, end of this he year. Well, he did say that, but the tre there have been submissions to the Treasury that you know, we, we already... Uh, so if you think about the trade we have, I think people have... I think as we come to realisation and practicalities, things are moving. Many people have said many different things on this subject, but I would say this to you. At the moment, with the Southern Ireland, we have a different currency, we have different excise duties, and we have different, uh, we, well, we have different VAT rates. And we're inside we, a single customs territory. I, I know, but we're, but we're able to deal with those things, moving goods around electronically, and we're able to deal with the different VAT rates electronically. It should be not beyond the wit of man or woman to, put, to make those things uh, work for registering the goods that are moving through and moving in, in, into... From the 1st of January? 
Well, I don't see why I don't I don't see why there should, that it it should be a problem to do it electronically. And some people have agreed with that. I'm not alone in thinking that. We do many other things electronically. No, I, I'm not disputing that. It could, well, I could dispute that it's possible to do that. But for the purposes of this conversation, I'm I'm not. The point here is that the UK government are firmly holding to position that the transition cannot extend beyond the first of January. So you need all of this to be in place by then. But we do. But we need no we need also that's, that's for goods travelling to the. To, to, that's goods only destined for Southern Ireland. That and and, but again, if we have a comprehensive free trade agreement, Canada style, that re that resolves the issue, and that's what we're working towards. It it it, it doesn't. Um, a, a comprehensive uh, Canada style agreement is not the equivalent to staying inside the European Union's customs territory. We are leaving the European Union's customs territory. The Republic of Ireland is clearly still in it. Northern Ireland, to remain aligned with that, is effectively still in it. There is a border in the Irish Sea. Everyone but the UK government acknowledges that borders require infrastructure, whether it's IT infrastructure, physical infrastructure, etc. Regardless of how much infrastructure you believe is required, there is 10 months before this has to come into place. But the point... The point rather that you make, Northern Ireland remains in the customs territory. This is our argument, on, uh, uh, and the Prime Minister's argument. Northern Ireland remains in the customs territory of the United Kingdom. But to remain And that's why Northern Ireland can benefit from the trade deals we're doing. To, to, for Northern Ireland to remain aligned with the Republic, and thus the, the EU on customs, to prevent a hard border on the island, Northern Ireland is de facto part of the European Union's customs territory. You've created a situation where you insist that Northern Ireland is both part of the UK customs territory and the EU's customs territory. That is possible if the UK as a whole were to remain completely aligned with the EU on customs, but that's not the UK government's intention. This is not a situation where you can square that circle. It has to be one or the other. The Canada Free Trade Agreement, do you think there's going to be customs declarations between Dover and Calais? The point I'm making here is that... No, but the point you're making... No, the point you made was what I said about a Canada Free Trade Agreement was wrong. It isn't wrong, it's right. There'll be no customs... In, in, if we do well, a why are CETA, HMRC saying that? Well, why are HMRC well, telling think, the First Minister think, think of HMRC, Ireland that there will HMRC, be? HMRC was... Were, you know, they, they, were, you. they may well have been answering questions to specific questions, but in the situation we're moving towards, which is a CETA, if we have a CETA, there will be no customs arrangements between uh, Dover and Cali any more than there will be between between Scotland and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland or, or indeed Holyhead and Dublin as we've all acknowledged why would it be any different but let's accept why would Holyhead and Dublin be any different to Cairn Ryan to Lawn? I think there's going to have to be infrastructure at Holyhead anyway but um, no, let's, let's accept your argument around smart infrastructure then. Can you just confirm that the UK government will be paying for all of this? That neither the Scottish government nor the Northern Irish executive will have to pay for any additional infrastructure? If, if, if there's infrastructure to go into place, my, my expectation, I can't make the commitment because I'm not, I'm not the Treasury, but my expectation is that the, that would be a UK government cost, not a Scottish government or a Northern Irish government cost. I think that's reasonable in the circumstances. That would, be, that would be entirely in line with my thinking. Would that extend to anything that you could describe as secondary infrastructure? So, for example, any requirements around um, improvements to the, the roads in your constituency, for example, um, to ensure that there are no tailbacks? Well, we, the, that, so under, under the current um, arrangements with the devolved administrations, we would have to come to an agreement with the Scottish Government on that because we can't just go and... We can't, we, can't, we can't demand that money is spent on the A75, nor can we, or the A77, nor can we give money to the Scottish Government and ring fences and tell them to spend it on the A75 or the A77. I mean, the money that comes to Scotland for the Scottish Government is entirely up to the Scottish Government how it spends it. I mean, a good example would be north of 90 million this year alone came to the Scottish Government as, as part of the Barnet Consequential on the, on the building of Crossrail. In, if, you know, so, so we can't tell them how that they have to spend it equally on infrastructure uh, just because Crossrail is an infrastructure project. Absolutely. And the question here is not about you insisting that that's how it's spent, but if, if there is collective agreement that it is required and that it is required as a result of the uh, trading relationship that you have negotiated, that you would front the cost. Well, I, I can't make commitments on behalf of the UK 
Treasury, but I can tell you this, as the Member of Parliament for Dumfries and Galloway, I continually press the case for the A75 and the A77 to be upgraded. I mean, the, those, those are proper important roads. In fact, the A75 is a Euro route uh, with, with two villages that the, truck, the vehicles have to go through. And I can assure you that the, the Scottish Government over the last 10 years, according to the uh, action group for the A75 and A77, will tell you that only 0.04% of the trunk road budget in the last 10 years has been spent on those roads. So I think it's long overdue that they, have, they've been, they should have been improved. I, th I think it's long overdue that rail infrastructure in, in your part of the world is ex so significantly I. expanded as well. But I feel so we're, do we're I. Now the rail infrastructure, again, is a responsibility for the Scottish Parliament, and I couldn't agree with you more. The, um, the future relationship with the EU, please. Yeah, yeah I think that line of questions concluded. Yeah, me, but just we, we did, as you probably know, um, Secretary of State visited uh, your constituency, visited the Stranraer area as part of our inquiry. And uh, the pertinent point about, about the roads and uh, any checks was that we met the resilience team and their current plan um, uh, if, for, for any other tailbacks may be caused by weather or other disruption is to close uh, a, a road, a minor road behind Stranraer and that's used for the lorries if there's a tailback. But they pointed out to us that that's not, that's an emergency situation. That's not a solution uh, that would be feasible. Um, for in the long term, if there were queues of lorries requiring checks, Joe, I for think example. that's changed. When did you go? Uh, we went about three weeks ago. Yeah, three or four weeks ago. Okay, well, the, the, resilience, the resilience plan is to use the very large car parks for the, at the for, former fer, ferry terminal. Well, that was what they were discussing at the, that, that particular time. Um, is that well, that is the resilience plan. Well, that, that will require some upgrades, having looked at the, the, the former car parks in Stranraer. Um, and there is an issue with the local community as well. I, when we visited, that certainly wasn't yeah. finalised. Um, so we'll, who will be providing the additional resources to upgrade so we, those facilities? We, well, the, the, as we headed towards the 31st of October, um, which was the uh, when we could have had a no-deal Brexit, uh, we took analysis. We, we, we analysed the, these problems and we discussed them. I, was, I sat in... Um, exo cabinet committee meetings and the um, me various cabinet secretaries would be, uh, if you like, screened in, video linked in for those meetings. And we went through a number of, a, a great number of issues and concerns to Scotland to make sure that we had them all ironed out. Around Cairn Ryan, we acknowledged the problem. The, the car park at, uh, at the Stranraer Ferry, former Stranraer Ferry Terminal was de deemed to be the solution. And we um, I, I, I'm not going to be hung up on the number, but the first tranche of money, I believe, that for, for Brexit planning that, went, that came to the, the Scottish Government was £137 million. And I think there was a second tranche of money as well from memory. Not as much, not nearly as much, but you know, still a substantial amount. And so the money, money has been committed for Brexit planning. You're saying that in, in future that the car park in Stranraer must be upgraded because it's derelict at the moment in order to accommodate... Well, it's not derelict. Bags. It's got weeds it's on it. I was, there, I was only there on Friday. It's not derelict by any country, yeah, by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. There are, it, it does need a good spray of Roundup, I agree. Yeah. Um, th th there's, it was also put to us, you know, the regeneration plans for Stranraer and Marina and Leisure and so on, you know, don't really necessarily... Um, they're not necessarily going to be helped by having a lorry park in the middle of it. Yes, but remember, the Lorry Park was a temporary solution. If, if, if you know, and it wasn't the long-term solution. That was just a temporary solution. If but there was a problem, in the same way that, it, and and and, and the, uh, regarding the, mari the, the marine development, um, you know that you and I both have um, representation in that area, and it would be very nice to see some progress on that. There is 16 million pounds committed to it, as you know, from the Borderlands Growth Deal. But I would also remind. Um, the Scottish Government that in 2015 they committed uh, 7 million to it and that still hasn't, the local authority still hasn't seen sight of that money. Yeah. I don't want to get down the so, well, no, You mentioned it, no, yeah, the well, marine development. I, I just want just... to clarify, you, uh, when you're talking about a lorry park in Stranraer, are you talking about a no deal scenario? Because that was the plan. That's what the resilience forums were. The resilience forums were dealing 
with the 31st of October, as I said, that was running into the 31st of October. That was the, uh, you know, and, and until such time as there's a marine development, the, 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 the lorry park remains there yeah. if there was but, an issue. But, what, but it's very, what we're it, talking it, about now, so, sorry to interrupt, but what we're talking about now is not an, an emergency deal, no emergency no deal scenario, correct. although that may still happen. What we're talking about is a permanent situation. And that would cause yes, but uh, well, in that case, yes. is that what you're talking about? No, so I, 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 I thought I cleared that in the uh, when, when I with Mr. Greer in the earlier remarks. So the checks will be there won't be checks on at, at Karen Ryan. I mean, I've had discussions with her with HMRC with uh, as well as an MP about this. The checks will be on that that uh, the sanitary fighter sanitary the animals the plants. Those checks will continue to be. Uh, uh, on the on the Northern Irish at Larn, they will not be the the checks are, are carried out there now, and they'll continue to be carried out there. There's no plan to move those checks, those sanitary and phytosanitary checks, to to Cairn Ryan. Okay. Well, obviously, there's a lot of people that don't agree with that, but I know that other members want to come in, so I'll bring in Annabel Ewing. Thank you. Good morning, Secretary of State. Um, returning to the issue of immigration, very important issue, uh, as you'll be aware, for Scotland. Um, you mentioned that you had been uh, speaking to various people, including businesses, over the last week. Uh, and I wonder, therefore, if you had had time to speak with the chief exec of the award-winning seafood processor, John Ross Jr. Limited Aberdeen, who was reported as saying yesterday uh, that um, the UK uh, immigration position uh, was disastrous, devastating and catastrophic for Scotland and uh, I think the Chief Exec was reported as going on to say that the UK government's proposed immigration system highlighted, and I quote, just how out of touch, end of quote, UK government ministers are with businesses. How would you respond to that, Secretary of State? Well, I can understand why he feels that... Um, that, that that there is an issue because I've acknowledged in, for certain sectors there is an issue and we're going to and we, we, we absolutely intend to address that um, regarding I think his sector is fish processing is that yes. right award winning seafood processor yes yeah, so you know I, I would encourage him to get in touch with either the Scotland office or the home office and I'd be very happy to explain to him why that the, the he will still have access to the labour he requires in the fish processing industry, as I outlined in the article I put in the Herald last week. So either there's a misunderstanding or, and it's possible, that he's upset about the fact that he will have to pay a little bit more money going forward. But I'm not going to make any apology for that. As I said earlier, I think if someone's standing in a cold factory processing fish, they deserve to be paid 20 plus thousand pounds. 20,480, I think, is the, is the lower level it would be if it was on the soil. But, uh, but you know, that's still below the Scottish minimum wage. It's above the national... Uh, Scottish living wage, sorry. It's above the national minimum wage, but it's below the living wage. And I, and I would argue that, that we should be paying at least the living wage for someone doing a job like that. We should be trying to increase people's salaries. There's been a tendency in the past for us to bring in cheap migrant labour and they've come on the basis that they get access to our NHS and our benefit system. And I think going forward, we have to, um, I think, as you know, the, the, the rules will be they'll make a contribution towards the NHS for the first five years, and then the, the, that will change. But it's right that while they're doing that, we should, employers should be paying them more money, and we should be, um, we should be proud of doing that. We should be looking to, 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 to raise wages and not, and not uh, try and still operate a low-wage economy. Well, I, I hear what you say. Uh, sorry, can I just respond to that and then maybe bring in uh, Ms. McGregor thereafter? Um, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, uh, to, to make a sweeping assumption about what motivated Mr... In fact, it was Mr Christopher... Saying, I said well, maybe. I just, sorry, it's my shot. Yeah. Right. To, to what motivated Mr Lay to, to make this, the very devastating comments that he did and to make this assumption that it's based on wages, I think that's a bit... Um, I'm, it's a uh, guess. It's yeah. showing a lack of prudence, if I may say, on the part of the Secretary of State for Scotland, and I think uh, you may wish to reflect on that and to actually speak with uh, Mr Lay directly, because I think you might be introducing 
uh, his position. But be that as it may, in terms of living wage, well, of course, you the Scottish better? government proposes could you explain a real better living what wage. His I don't think is. the UK government is proposing a real living wage as yet as a matter of policy. But on the issue of the statement you made about people, Europeans coming here to get access to our health service, I mean, I think really that level of debate about the, the participation of EU nationals in Scottish economic life and Scottish life I is didn't really say that. Uh, pretty poor from I didn't, the I didn't say that. Scotland. I didn't say that. You're putting words into my mouth. What well, I said... I think the record will show that you made that point. What I said was, I said, I, th I, think, I think bringing migrants in on lower wages that people would accept, local, that locally, that, that in, indigenous labour force would accept, driving wages down because of the other benefits that they get in this country, they don't get in their own country, and they come to work for those wages. That practice, and it has, you know, there have been many examples and accusations of it from the trade unions, and that was made very clear to me in a stakeholder engagement last week, and I accept, I accept what they say and the research that they've done, and I'm saying if that practice is going on, I have no, I, I have no compunction in saying it should stop. I think we should pay, pay proper wages to people for doing a proper job. That's what I'm saying. So don't put words into my mouth. Okay, well, I, I think... And as regards, as regards, I made an... I, I said if. I didn't say he was. I didn't say that he was making this statement about uh, the UK government being out of touch. What I'm saying is if his concern is about um, increases in wages, then I'm very happy to discuss that with him and debate it. As regards access to, to labour for fish you know, for processing plants and likewise, those are on the skilled list. The, the cap is coming off. We're reducing on the tier two visa limit the threshold. Um, there is no, the, 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 there should be no concern there about, about access to labour. Can I um, ask, on, in, in terms of the UK's recent uh, policy paper, I mean, what uh, input did the Secretary of State for Scotland have into that process? The policy paper for? On the UK's immigration. Policy. So I, I um, made my uh, position very clear in cabinet about about what I felt. It was the first cabinet after the reshuffle. I remember <coughs> it quite well on a Friday morning, and um, I. I think there are many merits to the points-based system. I would note that in the white paper for independence, where the, in 2014, the then Scottish government proposed a point-based system. So we, we agree with the Scottish government in a point base, uh, of, of that time that a points-based system is a good way to, to move forward. But I've raised then my concerns around uh, tourism, hospitality, and, and seasonal workers, and I continue to raise my concerns around that. And, Importantly, I'm act proactively looking for a solution. Sorry, 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 yes. sorry yes. Um, I just wanted to say something about um, the, you know, I think with the Home Office challenge here is in, is in designing a, an immigration system for the whole of the UK. And as the Secretary of State has, has noted, there are different challenges throughout different parts of the, the nations of the, the, the UK. Um, and I wanted to probably just push back on a, a suggestion that proposals that had been put forward by the Scottish Government had been dismissed out of hand. I don't recognise that at all. Um, it's, it's very much the case that Home Office colleagues have engaged quite extensively with businesses and stakeholders in Scotland. We speak to Scottish Government colleagues all the time. So I wanted to just um, make clear that you know some of the feedback that we get from uh, Scottish businesses and the events that we do and the engagements that we have is that, you know, the, the thought of having UK is actually something that they feel would be quite confusing and and difficult. Now that's not to say we shouldn't. Mr. McGregor noted the comments, you know, the, the comments that you know indicated total dismay on the part of you know a whole series of, of uh, bodies in Scotland that 
to, that greeted the UK immigration position, so the NFUS, Scottish Chamber of Commerce, Scottish Seafood Association, FSB, Scottish Tourism Alliance, to name but a few. I mean, the, the fact is that as with regard to the uh, proposals put forward by the Scottish Government in a very carefully considered paper that didn't seek to upset the devolution settlement, but just sort of work a way forward, which actually, I, from memory, I think they were put forward on a Monday and by Tuesday morning they've been rejected. That doesn't uh, indicate that there's any evidence of careful consideration by the UK government. But returning to an important point that the Secretary of State made, that he said that he spoke up for Scotland in Cabinet. Did he advocate uh, a rural pilot, for example? So I have discussed with, with other members in government the remote rural pilot, which was in the MAC, but I've also discussed other uh, ideas. I'm not going to go into those today because they're work in progress, and I don't want to, to jump the gun on that. I would just say that the stakeholders you mentioned, and many more, I met them all last week, and they were unanimous in one thing, which is they would like uh, us not in any way to devolve immigration. They want it to remain a UK-wide uh, matter, a reserve matter, and, uh, and I agree with them that we will not be devolving immigration and we will be looking, as I said much earlier in, in giving evidence today, for a UK-wide solution. Well, I, I hear what you say about not you won't be devolving immigration, but ultimately it won't be a, a, a gift within your hands with all due respect, Secretary of State, it will be Why a matter for the people of Scotland to decide. But um, on the important issue of well, uh, well, a regional approach for Scotland, <laughs> because that is, I think, what people do want. Now, what the Scottish Government put forward is not upsetting the constitutional position in immigration at all. It simply would have put forward, it simply did put forward a workable uh, solution. So, given the uh, particular needs yeah. of Scotland, the ageing population, the needs uh, as has, has been expressed very strongly on the part of particularly agriculture, fisheries and, and the hospitality sector. Why is it that the Secretary of State does not advocate a, a regional approach for Scotland? Scotland is not a region of the UK. Scotland's a nation. It has particular uh, uh, challenges in these areas. Why, are our, our position not, why is our position but not being respected? It, it, it's not not being respected. It, 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 I, I raised earlier the problems around the S code and why that would, could become a problem for the Home Office because of, there is freedom of movement clearly within the United Kingdom and that's completely right. But on the S code, it's where your house is uh, or your address is or your PO box number might be. I mean, it's, it's, it's not where you work and that's where that problem, where that solution falls down. We want to find a solution and we're actively working for a solution that works for the whole of the United Kingdom. All four nations the solution has to work for, and all regions within those four nations. And I made that point very clear earlier. It, that, that is the way forward on this, is to find something that works as well for people in North Wales as it does in the northwest of Scotland, as well for people in Cornwall or Somerset as it might do in Angus or, or uh, in Northern Ireland. It, it is, it, it, it's important we get that right. And actually, when people come to work in this country, they should be able to do a job and feel that they can move to another part of the United Kingdom to, if they want to move to another part of the United Kingdom, to work in, in a similar industry somewhere else. We shouldn't tie people, we shouldn't t t tie people to one region or one nation. One last question, Mimi. I appreciate it very brief. Um, the, the, the Secretary of State mentioned that, that his response to the Scottish Government's, uh, one of the proposals put forward by the Scottish Government on the Scottish visa, and I, I hear what he says about the technical issue he raised, I would imagine there'd be many ways to, to resolve that, but that suggests that there has been a written analysis of the Scottish Government's uh, policy paper. Uh, can the Secretary of State confirm that's the case, and can we be provided with a copy? Well, we, we have, an, we, um, as to what the Home Office has done in anal analysing it, I can't say, but we certainly within our office have, have, have read it and debated it and discussed it, and we have come to the conclusion, as I said earlier, that we need a, a UK-wide solution. So is there a but, written piece uh, of paper? The, de the Deputy Director of Policy and I have spent a lot of time on this subject. Do you want to add to that? I mean, I, I, I can't say any more than I've said already. I mean, uh, uh, we haven't done a public consultation on or, or a public response and that's and and that's wouldn't be the responsibility of the scotland office to do that i mean just to, the, the the paper that the scottish government put forward does make some uh some of the analysis in there chimes with our own and some of the analysis on 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 the demographic challenges that scotland face which built on the report that christina boswell did um a really useful report which i think fed into the mac 
uh, proposals on, on, on the rural pilot, which, which you talked about earlier. Um, so all this, all, all this is, being, is, 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 is being looked at, but um, I mean, the S code is not designed as a, the S tax code is not designed as an immigration measure. It's not, that's, that's not its purpose. That's not what it's used for. And therefore, to pick something that is designed to manage a tax system and say, well, we'll use this as immigration control, it, 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 it isn't, it isn't going to work. I mean, well, the the, there isn't a... I have invited Priti Patel uh, to give evidence to the committee on this particular subject. So any, um, any representation she could make on our behalf, and we could hear the Home Office's view uh, firsthand, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Convener. Um, Secretary of State, uh, earlier on in your evidence, you um, can you hear me all right if I've got this position right? <laughs> uh, you mentioned that there would be no trade-off of fisheries against any other priority. So how likely is it that the UK will give EU fishing fleets access to um, UK waters in order to gain a better deal for financial services? We won't be doing that. We will give them access to UK waters, but we will do it on the basis that we are an independent coastal state. We will go to the Fisheries Council along with the devolved administrations, as we do at present, uh, working together on that. But we aren't trading off for financial services or anything else um, access to waters, and that is one of our guiding principles on this negotiation. I would, I would just, if I could just say a little bit, though, to, because there is much, it's, it's very kind of you to give me a chance to talk about this, because there's a, the, the, there are many misconceptions around this. The, our, our fishing waters, um, at the moment, we go to the Fishing Council, we, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a debate about access, French boats, Spanish boats, etc., etc., but we also have to cut a deal as uh, the EU cuts a deal and we will as, as the UK with the Icelanders and the Norwegians and etc etc and fish don't fish don't have boundaries you know they, there's no they, they can they, they, we had the cod wars many years ago the cod will go north and the cod will come south and we have to all work together equally I know the fishermen in Kukubri in my constituency will go and get the scallops off the Brittany coast at certain times of the year and likewise scallop fishermen from Brittany will come to the UK waters or even the Isle of Man waters. So we understand there have to be trade-offs. We understand that completely. And we don't, we're not saying we will deny access to UK waters. And we'll make that very clear in these negotiations. I've spent quite a bit of time work on this with the, 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 uh, the, the, the negotiating uh, team. Just, you know, the, the, because obviously I take interest in the things that are important to Scotland and this is absolutely critical to Scotland because we can over a period of 10 or 20 years increase the number of boats we have fishing our waters and we can certainly increase with certainty our processing plants and we'll be able to do that because we will go to ICES ISIS, for the science as we go forward. We're going to do zonal attachment, we're going to change the way we negotiate and the way the Norwegians do and we will use the science so that we don't, uh, at the moment, cod stocks are very low, for instance, so we don't run our stocks too low, and we have a sustainable fishery out there, which is really, I think, it's important for the industry as well as important for the environment. I, th I think there's some sort of conflict within um, certain sectors of the fisheries about the ISIS um, science and, and, and the reliability. Absolutely. I'm not going to get into that. No, no, if, 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 I, if the ISIS science is incorrect and there's a better... Uh, there's something better, then I'm all ears. I, I, I will make their case. I, I, changing the tack slightly, when we talk about fisheries, um, it's not just um, the fish that are caught in the sea, but there's also aquaculture, our salmon exports, um, our shellfish. Um, I represent a fishing community of Shetland. Um, Scottish mussels, for example, 80% um, of those are grown in Shetland. So um, there's concern about how we'll be able to continue exporting. So I wonder if you could make comment on that. Uh, uh, it, in terms of the free trade agreement, the, the, the exports will continue as they are now. In terms of getting them to market, um, and we, you know, we put a lot of effort into this, the Scotland office, running up to the 31st of October when there was the risk of no deal, and it's all about the short straits. And we have to um, be very... Uh, we have to acknowledge that the... the, the the, the, the fish that leave Scotland go in refrigerated lorries through the short straits, through Dover to Cali, mainly between midnight and 2 a.m. through the Channel Tunnel to get to the Boulogne fish market by 4 or 5 in the morning. 
And those are strong markets. And we, we had, um, just as medicines were coming one way in that agreement, we agreed that the, 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 the equivalent, uh, if you like, transport going the other way would be, um, would, would be shellfish and fresh fish. So we, we recognize it's important in getting to markets. We recognize it's important keeping markets open. And the reason, you might wonder why I mentioned the, um, the, the, what, happened, what would have happened for the 31st of October but didn't happen is because it is still entirely possible when the French don't get access, a, a, a guaranteed 10, 20, 30 years access to our fishing waters, and it's an annual negotiation, that the fishermen will block, blockade the port of Calais, and that would have a problem for, cross, you know, the, for, for the ferry system. But we will still prioritize fresh fish and shellfish going through the short straits and or, uh, through the channel tunnel, which they can't blockade, as you can appreciate, um, in, in, in those hours between midnight and 2 a.m. to get to the Boulogne fish market. So it's still on our radar. We haven't lost sight of it in the, in the um, planning committee that we have. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gordon Lindhurst. Um, just briefly, Secretary of State, um, European Union countries have, as a matter of standard, systems in place for individuals to register where they live, or, and if they move, each individual has to register. Uh, and other requirements they have, uh, for example, the requirement for an individual to produce to police uh, on request without the police having any grounds for requesting it, identification documents, and uh, for example in Germany when they had about a million asylum seekers and migrants come to the country, suddenly within months they changed the law so that these individuals were required to carry identification documents um, uh, and be treated equally with German citizens. Now, we have no such systems in Scotland or the United Kingdom, and those systems allow for these countries to have differentiated immigration requirements or treatment in different parts of European Union states. Has the Scottish Government made any proposals or indicated in what way it would change the law in Scotland, change the administrative systems, or change the rights of individuals within Scotland so that such a system could be introduced, as I think Annabel Ewing was suggesting? Um, not that I'm aware, no. Not to the, certainly not to the Home Office that I'm aware of, that we've been made aware of. And, and, and in the, the way the system works in, in Whitehall, anything that had gone to a department that involved Scotland would have been circulated to us. But the director of the office may know differently. But I, well, I, I think, certainly um, haven't seen anything directly. I mean, from my point of view, I haven't seen anything directly. I think from my point of view, um, the, the, the particular proposal on the, on the sort of differentiation and the, and the kind of the S code um, set out what the benefits of it might be, but didn't actually go into the detail of what would happen if, if, if people didn't abide by it. And, if, if, and, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, whole, the, the whole sort of setup in, in the UK, I mean, I remember... Um, uh, in 2010, um, when the the coalition government came in, the 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 sort of the, the the drive to sort of abolish the sort of identity card systems and things, which has been an ethos of was an ethos of that government and has continued through. So I think it would require, as you say, it requires a huge practical um, uh, issue and a kind of a, a totally different approach within Scotland and the rest of the UK. And I'm not sure that, um, you know, I'm not sure from my discussions with Scottish Government colleagues, and I do talk to them all the time, that that would be the kind of regime that they would have in mind. Well, just if I could very briefly, because I, I think you know, Mr. Lindhurst, I was Deputy Ambassador in Berlin before I came here. And so the German system is one that I'm aware of. And you're right that they run a, a something that's similar to a points-based system that allows car workers to gain more access to, an, to, to immigration if they go to Baden-Württemberg, where the car factories are, rather than if they go to Hamburg, where there aren't any car factories. But you are totally right that that system only works because of these additional internal controls that Germany has, which are appropriate to a country which has a huge green border that they therefore cannot police um, and cannot control in the same way as we in the UK because the only way that you can arrive in the UK um, or in GB is on an aeroplane or on a boat or through the Channel Tunnel 
um, we're able to police our borders rather more effectively than Germany. And so we've chosen, in for the civil liberty reasons that you and my director have, have, has outlined, we've chosen not to go down that route in the UK. Um, but you're right that a differentiated immigration system would require considerably more in terms of in, internal control. So, so just, to, just to sum that up effectively, I think from previous comments of the Secretary of State, what, what you're saying is an immigration system is not just about who you allow or bring into the country to work in the country, but it's also about what happens within the country, uh, which includes the, the services that people who come to work in the country are entitled to, uh, as well as uh, where they work and so forth and so on. It's not just as simple as saying we will allow certain individuals in to work in the country. We would agree with you on that, definitely, yes. Right. Thank you. Okay, we've got a supplementary from Kenneth. Well, it was, uh, I've only ever had one supplementary, so this is my actual question, really. It's about, you mentioned the A75 and A77 and issues in relation to infrastructure, but the Prime Minister has suggested, uh, uh, you know, as a kind of Brexit bonus, so to speak, a 15 to 20 billion pound bridge between Northern Ireland and Scotland, although I don't know how they're going to bridge the three and a half mile wide, thousand foot deep Beaufort gap, but if... If that, I'm, I hope you, you, you will, but if this does not come to fruition and the Scottish Government is certainly sceptical and believes 20 billion could be better spent, would the 20, 15 to 20 billion estimated cost be allocated to the Scottish Government so that it could invest in other infrastructure projects, such as, for example, the A77 and the A75, which I'm sure your constituents would uh, frankly prefer? Well, that's an excellent question. I, I, I didn't think I was going to get the subject today, but I'm delighted I have. Um, I, I, and I can clear up a few things. So, <coughs> I mean, we must go back and remember that your cabinet secretary, Mike Russell, and had a big, big spl splash in one of the newspapers in 2018 about the need for a bridge to Northern Ireland. So let's get that point out there immediately. So he was quite keen on it then, and you can certainly look up online and read the article. I'm very keen on it now, but it's not a bridge that I'm keen on, it's a tunnel. And it's no different to the tunnels connecting the Faroes, it's no different to the tunnels going uh, underneath the fjords, and it deals with the problem of, uh, removes the problem of Beaufort's dike and the World War II munitions, the million tons that allegedly were dumped in there. It also deals with the problem of weather. I think it would be, it could easily be 100 days a year that, due to weather or wind that that bridge wouldn't operate. So the, the, the bridge, for me is, 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 is a euphemism for a link, which is a tunnel, just to be clear about that. And actually, tunnelling techniques now are quite advanced, and, and certainly to go from southwest Scotland to Northern Ireland, it would be less expensive. As Knowing what we know of the geography of the North Channel, it would be less expensive to, to tunnel it. It goes without saying that if there's going to be a tunnel before there's a tunnel, there will have to be an upgrade of the A75 and the A77. And uh, so I see a huge advantage in the tunnel for that. I see a huge advantage in the tunnel for um, Southwest Scotland's economy. We have the lowest GVA per head of population in the UK, that, so it can only help us. I see advantages for the Northern Ireland economy, um, clearly, and I see advantages in that you'll be able to be, get from Carlisle to Belfast or Glasgow to Belfast considerably quicker than you can now. Yeah, I mean, I've actually been through one of the Faroese, a few of the few Faroese tunnels, actually, and I do think they are quite uh, magnificent. But, I mean, we'd be talking about a tunnel on a much greater scale than anything they've achieved and far, far deeper if we're going to have to go a thousand feet down. And there'll That's be issues... Gods. There's, yeah, there'll, but there's also issues about, uh, you know, how, um, you know, you would uh, avoid people being asphyxiated in a, you know, a 20 yes. kilometre long tunnel, etc., etc. It's, 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 it's the, the same distance as the ch Channel Tunnel. Yes. 22, 22 miles. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and so we're not asphyxiating them as best I know at the moment in the Channel Tunnel. Well, I mean, to be fair, you know, I mean, I think that, that that's correct, but we're, we're talking about much further depths, for example, in the Channel Tunnel. The, the depth but isn't for asphyxiation, though. I mean, it's, it, you know, the, yeah. there are, uh, air, there are ex air exchange systems that work, and um, the, there are longer tunnels. So it, depth is not the issue. Once, okay. once you're underground, you're underground. It's the, the issue is uh, the, the distances, and there are much longer tunnels in China, for instance. 
Okay, but the, the, the initial question remains, if this does not go ahead for whatever reason in terms of feasibility, uh, or uh, would the money uh, come to Scotland in terms of other infrastructure? Because England's getting 109 billion invested in HS2, which stops at Leeds and Manchester. So would Scotland so get I, I, I would argue that I would like HS2 to, to come up through the spine of the United Kingdom. Um, in, in, I would, I, 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 in their lifetimes? I, I think it would be wonderful <laughs> in my lifetime. Doesn't it look like I'm not looking very healthy. <laughs> no, I, I would, I would argue that that I would like to see HS2 come up through the spine of the country. I would argue that I'd like to see the tunnel connecting Southwest Scotland to Northern Ireland, but I would make the point that there will be uh, a Barnet consequential from HS2, and therefore, as there is from Crossrail, which I mentioned earlier, you know, this year it was north of 90 million alone went to the Scottish government as a consequential of the of, of the Crossrail. So. That's massive amounts of money. What, what I can't tell you, and I will not tell you, is how the Scottish Government should spend that money. So it will get a consequential payment, and it has already had actually a consequential payment from the exploratory work that's gone into HS2. There has been a Barnet consequential payment made already uh, on that. What I won't do is, to, is tell the Scottish Government, because it's not within my remit, how they should spend that money. It's up to them to decide what, if, whether they want to spend it on infrastructure or they want to spend it on something else. That is entirely a, a call for the Scottish Government. But the money for the bridge uh, uh, stroke tunnel won't be ring-fenced only for that. So, for example, if it's decided to allocate infrastructure funds, uh, can the, the Scottish Government, government I, I should stop you there. The tunnel, we're not talking about bridges. Okay, the, tunnel is, okay. the, the tunnel is uh, at the at, at discussion stage. It may move to feasibility stage. Right. In the interim, we'll, we, you know, we can we can start to have the debates about whether it's viable, whether it's going to help the Northern Ireland economy and the and the Scottish economy, and what the benefits are there. Indeed. Because it sort of has a, you know, there's two nations with of specific interests in it. But I think, we're, we're, I, I, and I completely appreciate your point, is would that money be spent better elsewhere? And that's, that's a, that will be a decision for, 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 for government. In close, we want to do this in, once we get better sight of the costs involved and the yeah. tunnelling costs and the this, that and the other, should that be the route we go down? Should the Prime Minister decide to press the button? And it's entirely his decision. We would then want to um, engage with, with both Stormont and Holyrood to uh, get... Uh, a better understanding of the of the benefits and 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 the challenges. We're not going. To, we're, we're not going to just come riding in roughshod and slam Indeed. a tunnel in. And by the way, under the uh, devolved the, the, the you know the settlement of, of of devolution, nor can we. But if not, Scotland will get those funds for other infrastructure projects. Is the point? Well, that's for the, that's a matter for the Treasury and the Prime I'm Minister. But I do I do admire yeah. you. I have to say I absolutely admire you uh, for pressing the case, <laughs> and and you're quite right to do so. And if <laughs> I was in your shoes, I'd be doing the same. I really hope we haven't brought in okay. We are Thank going into much. a bit of a tunnel in terms of the yes. questioning here, I think. Yes. Um, if yes. I could bring in Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Now, can I just clarify uh, one area, and that's regarding uh, fishing. Uh, is fishing a red line for the UK government? We, it's, it's, so we, we, we don't talk about red lines. And I, I've never... I, it's a very fair question you ask. And, and, and funny enough, bizarrely, no one's ever asked me it before. I thought they might have done before now. But... I. Again, if I go back to my business career and negotiating deals, I, I never had red lines. I always tried to, to leave the door open to get to a solution, if that makes sense. Even when there was a standoff, you try and leave the door open. It's important you do that if you want to get deals done. And I think here, we, we, we're not talking about red lines. And I will never set red lines. I will set out what, my, you know, in my own career as, as Secretary of State, I will set out what I believe are sort of guiding principles and objectives, and I will work hard to achieve those. And I think that's where we are with, you know, we've, we have said that we will not uh, trade off our, our fishing for, for, for anything else in this deal, and we will go forward. And we've been very clear we want a Norway deal. I understand, and this is not my position, I want you to, because I'm, I'm not the negotiating team, but I understand from the negotiating team and from what, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said in Parliament last Thursday is that we would walk away rather than trade away our, our fishing rights. So you can determine that if you want to in, in, in your language as a red line, but that wasn't a, a statement that was made and it was 
made in, in, the, in, the, in the negotiating position and objectives paper that was, re that was released. No, uh, I, I, I'm not a fan of the word red lines because I think in red, although our position is we're not trading away fishing, we've made that absolutely crystal clear. I think red lines get people's backs up a little bit and they set red lines. And once you set red lines, you stand there and you just start arguing about everything and anything where there's a number of things we have to negotiate here and, and agree that's to our mutual benefit. And we should, you know, we should be careful not to be too you know, confrontational. We've, we, we've had the difficult bit, which was the 31st of January. And I think we've now moved on to uh, an environment where we want to cooperate and work with the EU as partners and build a strong trading relationship. So just to clarify, uh, you don't like using red line, uh, but you also, it's not, uh, I'm quoting you from earlier, it's not uh, trading off, but at the same time, um, it will be for negotiation with the EU uh, to get some type of deal going forward. No, so we, we, the, the position is that but we. But the door's are going to be left open. Say you, again? The door will be left open. As well, you the just door's left. Said so, in leaving the, I think I covered that earlier. In leaving the door open, what we're saying to them is we're going to come to the Fisheries Council, the, the um, DEFRA minister and the ministers from the devolved administrations will come to the Fisheries Council to negotiate access to our waters at the Fisheries Council. But we are, we are absolutely not saying to them, by the way, come 2021, you can't, you're not going to fish in British waters anymore. We understand that we have to come to this uh, in a practical way. We want access to their waters, they want access to ours. That agreement uh, exists with Norway and Iceland, and, and we believe it's, it's the right agreement for the United Kingdom. And we, agree, and we actually believe that's quite achievable. We understand the French are... Uh, uh, upset about that and, and, and digging their heels in. But they are not the EU negotiating team. And the EU negotiating team, I think, will understand that the French have to speak out on behalf of the fishermen. I understand that. But they will also understand that in the practical terms, what we're offering, which is no different to what Iceland and Norway are offering, is completely reasonable as a sovereign nation. So it is about negotiation, about access to UK fishing waters, Scottish fishing waters. So, uh, so the negotiation is, is at the Fisheries Council. Is, is uh, that's no. where that negotiation? Not at, not in the EU trade negotiations. We are not trading off our fishing in the EU trade negotiations for something else. We are we, we are we are very clear to them. We are very clear to them. If 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 they're demanding a trade off for our fishing, then we then you know that will be for us we, 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 a, a, a non-starter. But but they know that. They absolutely know that. But what we are saying is that we're very happy to go to the Fisheries Council as an independent coastal state and discuss access to, access to our waters as appropriate based on sustainable fish stocks and all the other factors that come into play. Okay. okay. Um, uh, one other issue is the issue of Erasmus. Now, uh, obviously, through the, uh, the Canada-style deal that's been spoken about, Erasmus uh, Plus is not uh, part of that. Um, can you confirm today that the, that the UK will continue with some type of agreement with the Erasmus Plus scheme? And I'm, I'm asking that question as somebody who benefited from taking part in an Erasmus scheme in the past. So there are, there are a num number of schemes, Horizon, uh, Copernicus, Erasmus, and all I can confirm today is that we are in discussions with the EU about uh, participation in all those schemes. As to what the final outcome is, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'd be jumping the gun. I think Erasmus has enormous benefits and lots of people have benefited from it. And, and were we not to come to an agreement for whatever reason on participation in Erasmus, I would be pressing hard that we put in place a similar scheme um, that, hap that, that works both for our domestic student, do domestically for students within the UK uh, university system, but also to enable students to go to both the, the EU and to America, where there are very good universities. So the principle of Erasmus, I can, uh, my own personal position is I can tell you, I, I, the principle of Erasmus, uh, and and I think I do think it should be means tested. I think it should be students from less well off backgrounds who benefit from it. Um, and and but I, I I I think if we have to replace it, it should be uh, there should be something else put in place that achieves the same, if not better, uh, is where I'd say. But as to what the outcome would be, it's a fair question, but I can't give you the answer because all I know is that that and many other European uh, projects are, are under discussion. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned uh, tourism earlier on as well, Secretary of State, and how important 
uh, you believe tourism to be, and it very much is. Now, the, um, I raised this question to the Cabinet Secretary a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it was on the issue of marine tourism uh, and uh, marinas across uh, Scotland. Is it uh, marine? I can't hear Marinas marine. across Scotland. Um, uh, the uh, there potential then could be the situation of, uh, of uh, border checks taking place at marinas uh, as a consequence of uh, there has been a growing number of people travelling to Scotland from EU nations taking part in also marine tourism activities sailing into marinas. Will the UK government pay for any additional infrastructure that will be required across that sector? not working so can you hear me uh, yes it's quite it's it's quite a detailed question but the border checks for the uk the checks at the borders on people won't change so i don't under it's marinas so, Se people sailing yeah. in on a pleasure boat at the moment it, at the moment if you're french and you arrive in the uk you have to show a passport and after brexit if you're french and you arrive in the uk you'll have to show a passport so I'm not sure what the change is, but so maybe if you can explain that, and then we probably have to get back yeah. to you on it. Yeah. So that's all right. It's, uh, I, I chair the cross-party group uh, in that particular area, recreational water and marine tourism. It's an issue that's been raised in that cross-party group, uh, and with, uh, uh, with the fear that, uh, with, uh, particularly in the, north, uh, in the northeast of Scotland, where people coming in, particularly from the Scandinavian countries and also from Germany, uh, and there has been increasing numbers, that uh, there might well be uh, additional barriers put in place to these individuals coming to Scotland uh, and as a consequence, a potential additional cost to that sector. So I'd be grateful if you could even potentially write uh, to the committee. That's completely fair. I mean, uh, Nick, who, who, who's a bit of an expert in these matters, will, um, will look into it and we will, I will write to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Secretary of State, can I thank you for your evidence today and I uh, look forward to you coming back to give evidence to the committee as we continue the yin and yang of negotiations for our future relationship with the EU over the course of this year.